Hello, Professor Falola. Um, how in your career did you start working with global history and what defines it in your conception? Uh, thank you. Um, I studied in Nigeria from the 1950s till 1980 when I got my PhD and began to, to also teach in Nigeria. So the issue of um, when you come to understand globalization uh, is, I would say, from the very start of my life, the first day, because I was a member of the British Empire. <laughs> so colonial subjects were part of a global forces of imperialism. So in other words, I was born into it. And when we began to go to school, the slab by many of the contents were Eurocentric, British oriented. There's a global uh, educational impact. So in high school, you are to read Shakespeare, for instance, Arid Hamlet. Nothing can be more global than that <laughs> in terms of finding a clever way, as Gramsci argued, to introduce globality, globalism, imperialism to you via institutions of the church and education. Now, in school, at the university, it was the age of what you call developmentalism, in which African countries were looking for solutions to development. And those solutions would drive you first to understand what they call developed countries. You have to do the histories. Second, to understand development models. So that the development models introduced to us were framed in the global forces of modernization, global forces of capitalism, and attempt to discredit the global forces of socialism. And the overarching project of developmentalism was modernity. Whether in Brazil or India or Nigeria, anytime you are searching for modernity, you are already strong. You are already developing global history. You can do it consciously. As if you said, I want to know about Britain. Or you can do it unconsciously through asking students to read Shakespeare. Or you can do it as a policy where you are introduced to so-called global forces of modernity and development. Uh, so in those various ways, one's career was embedded in that project and structured in that project. And you live by that project and its consequences. So if I call you a colonial subject, it, 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 it's subject. If I call you primitive, if I call you underdeveloped, all these are global history in their dynamics in which you have been inserted. Out of your will, <laughs> out of your will, without your permission, colonial subjects, post-colonial subjects, subaltern subjects, they are all inserted and in, embedded into the forces of global history. Yeah, okay. Um, and what are the possibilities for dialogue between the local and the global, the micro and the macro? Well, this can take me one hour to, to flesh out but I won't spend all your time. So those possibilities have always been there. Although you frame it as if it's new, it's not. So when you talk about movements and mobility in history, 
before before BC. That's what we're talking about. And these movements and mobility have been with us for centuries. When you talk about the development of world religions, Islam and Christianity, they were local, but they became regional and they became global. So Islam, religion, Christianity was created in a small place. Islam was created in Mecca, Medina, small places, but they became global and triggered a global conversation around religion. By the 11th century, Arabism and Islam had spread in North Africa, going further down. By the 13th century, Mansa Musa of Mali Empire, the richest man of his time, made a costly and elaborate pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia. Those are conversations. By the 15th century, the Portuguese had destroyed the flourishing city of Kilwa. Kilwa, Mogadishu, all part of that Swahili culture were connected in a global traffic that reached Gujarat, connected to the Persian world, connected to Cairo, connected to the Chinese silk trade. And you can see this elaborate dialogue going on at both what you call the micro and the macro. Let me give examples. Take the Atlantic Ocean and the transatlantic slave trade. Those were tremendous global forces bringing ideas, conversation, transatlantic world, the Black Atlantic, the Atlantic economies, the Atlantic ideas, the spread of food from Brazil to Lagos. By the, by the 18th, 19th century, there were Brazilian style houses along the coast of West Africa. So it's so intense. Or oh, if you talk about trans-Saharan trade, goods move from Kano to, to Morocco, to Cairo, Cairo being the center of a global network of trade. So that conversation, has, they have always been there. And that dialogue has always been there. If you, move, if you mean for the most recent, you have Pan-Africanism. You have the idea of negritude. You have dependency theory originating in Latin America, spreading to Africa as a conversation on developmentalism and theories. You, you have Pentecostalism all over the world now. You have Pan-Africanism. You have Nascimento, your great scholar, in conversation with poets of negritude all over the world. You have Pierre Vagé, a distinguished Brazilian scholar. What did he specialize on? He specialized on the Yoruba. I'm Yoruba. Where did I meet him? He lived in Nigeria, the university where I attended. What were his books about? About plants, a way, about medicine, collected in, in Yoruba, among the Yoruba, brought to Brazil. Now the book has been translated into Portuguese. I was in one Candomblé house in the countryside of Sao Paulo. I saw his book there. As soon as I got to the house, it was exactly similar to the house of my father built in the 1940s with a garden of herbs and plants, with the way the compounds were arranged, with the multiple women, so, so this, these conversations are so global. They've been with us for a long time, only that they are changing. They're changing. Thank you. Thank you. And how to work with the multiple temporalities of global history? Is there a short term global history? Okay, I will just, um, 
Look at it from my own side. What is of interest to me? Which is the issues around epistemologies of the South? In confrontation with the epistemologies of the North, but in interactions with one another. So, those multiple temporalities must confront these epistemologies. Epistemic violence, in what ways did global ideas destroy the ideas from the South? Epistemic suicide, in what ways did the people in Nigeria and Brazil give up on their own ideas to accept dominant ideas. Relabeling, redefining the imposition of new ways of understanding the world by which you either destroy, suppress, undermine your own ways of understanding the world. And that is key to my own interest. And, and, and part of the rescue operation in these temporalities is the interrogation of terms, questioning definitions of developing, development, poverty. Those have to be questioned. Questioning the terms, the labels we use, what is world history if you misrepresent the maps? What is world history if I can eat your food, but you cannot eat mine? What is world history if I'm wearing my best clothes and you call it pajamas? In which that world history becomes not world history, but hegemonic impositions. So, I prefer a methodology that will slice this global history into ideas, ideations, ontologies, ways of knowing, ways of thinking, before we can even begin to construct the historical narrative. Because historical narratives are not neutral. I can't just say I'm interested in um, Spain and Brazil and Brazil and Lagos. What are the underpinning ideologies guiding my interest? And then how do I do the unit of analysis? Am I doing the unit of analysis to reinforce hegemonic ideas? Because I also have to pay attention to units of analysis. And I have to pay attention to language. You have to pay attention to the archives before I can now begin to map out areas that I want to slice, because what you call global history can be another limb for imperialism, if you are not very careful. In other words, we're just replacing imperialism of the 19th century with globalism of this current century. And you are doing exactly the same thing. You're still seeing Brazil, Africa, dark continents. These are subjects and things like that. And, and those temporalities must uh, be very sensitive to people and their ways of knowing, their ways of knowing. If I come to a in Bahia, that's a way of knowing that you do not represent in these temporalities and in the conception of global history. Um, does each type of research object has the potential to become global history? Mm -hmm. Yes and no. Uh, so you have on the yes side, you know, there is, you can't just make that distinction all the time because you have to consume, 
Anytime you consume products, you're already part of that global history, even though you may be local. If you take tobacco, in 18th century Ghana, Gold Coast, or Accra, among the Ashanti, it may be tobacco from Brazil. If you drink alcohol in Lagos in the 18th century, it could be from Portugal, although you call it local. If you engage in leisure and you put a porcelain in your house to decorate the pot to decorate your house, it could have been from China. Our behaviors, um, behaviors that you think are local can, can have global origins. So yes, any, any research you take, you can look at its global components, the embeddedness into the global. You, you, you can frame it that way. Because for a long time, it has been difficult for any society not to be part of that global forces. So you can study a village in terms of its global forces. The clothes they wear, the utensils they use, the food they consume, even the language they speak. But you can also say consciously, you want to study them as localism. How do they reject those forces, especially of ideas, of forceful penetration of hegemonic ideas, forceful penetration of worldviews that change their worldview. You can study them as such. But you can also consciously say you want to do decoloniality. Remember a moment ago I spoke to epistemology. You can also say you want to decolonize the knowledge you have been received. And in decolonizing, you want to begin to assert your own forces. You want to give integrity to the way you think. You want to assert your own values. And you also have to study comparative ways of living, comparative ways of survival and see the extent to which you can use ideas to understand yourself, to reform your space, and to engage with a variety of people in different parts of the world. And in your opinion, what are the main risks and the main challenges in global history? First of all, to undermine your own ontologies. That's how you narrate yourself. Second, to undermine the tools of your own analysis. Third, to undermine your language. Number four, to undermine your own culture. And if you accumulate all this to undermine your own epistemology, because if you undermine all of that, you become a victim of definition. Let me give you an example. COVID-19, COVID-19. If you look at the narratives, the African system of boosting immune system food as medicine, they began to call it alternative medicine. So the bitter leaf, a wuro in candomble houses, it becomes alternative medicine. But vitamin C is medicine. <laughs> but they're basically doing the same thing. But you call one that is organic to you, alternative to the one you received. 
that is one big risk. Because by doing that, you are not allowing what you call an alternative to develop. Second, they frame things you have been doing for centuries as new. For instance, they told Africa that social distancing is new, quarantine is new. No, they were not new. They were just doing it differently. What you call vaccination, the Yoruba people call it incisions. They even did it in candomblé houses. Instead of using the long needle to inject medicine, they use a piece of blade to do small cut and put the medicine in the blood to get to your means to get to your blood stream. So incision becomes illegitimate, vaccination becomes legitimate. And for centuries, Africans have been doing quarantine. That's how they treated mental illnesses. That's how they treated depression. That's how they treated leprosy. That's how they treated rabid infection. That's how they treated all sorts of diseases. That they, they contact diseases. They've been doing so for centuries. And now when you say to prevent COVID-19, do social distancing. How do you do social distancing in Sao Paulo and Lagos, in Mexico City? Cities of 20 million people, how do you social distance? How do you social distance in Lagos, given the way they build houses? 20 people can be in the same house, in their own rooms, sharing bathroom and sharing kitchen. Those are part of the risk in which you take ideas that work in Western societies. And you now say, go and use them in the Congo, go and use them in Lagos. That's not going to work. Or even in ordinary things like food. Cultures have food over the centuries that blend with the bodies that did not give them diabetes and high blood pressure. Then you introduce new ways of feeding into them and suddenly they change their body structure. When Africans come to the US, they, they, they were lean. Three years later, they became fat. Why? They change their diets. Yoruba culture, likes to eat bitter food, food that is bitter. They don't put sugar in soup. Then you come to the US, they put sugar in everything you eat. They put sugar in sauce. If you barbecue at the back of your house, those barbecue sauces are basically sugar. Your body, for years you've been born, in Ibadan was used to something bitter. You come to Austin where I live, you begin to eat sugar. And then one day you wake up, you look at yourself in the mirror. From 140 pounds, you've already become 200 pounds. And you ask yourself, what is going on? And then the nutritionist will say, do this, do that. And everything the nutritionist is telling you doesn't work. Because you probably come from a culture where they don't eat three meals. And your nutritionist will now say, breakfast is the best food in the morning. Who told you that? <laughs> Who told you that? Maybe you have been doing intermittent fasting, eating twice a day, in which you're basically fasting for 14 hours and your body is adapted to it. And then the nutritionist said, no, Amanda, breakfast is the best. And then you had one more meal. <laughs> so that's one of the risks in which knowledges are basically local. Many of what we call universal knowledge, this, the, the, basically the extension of Western local ideas. Christianity was a local religion. Islam was a local religion. And then they globalized them. And as they spread, some societies have the wisdom to localize them. 
some have the wisdom to translate them, some have the wisdom to decolonize them. And I want to close by saying the risk of any form of global history is to receive ideas without domesticating them, without asking yourself, how does this idea work within my space and for my own people? Thank you very much, Amanda. Thank you, Dr. Falola. Enjoy. Thank you so much. <laughs>